Do you want to win a Ford Bronco or $75,000 in cold hard cash? Ridge Wallet are giving you the chance to do just that, so click the link below or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Farmers, I mean gamers, welcome back to part two of this week in video games. It's like The Last of Us part two, only with less golf. Actually, that's not true. Wii Sports is getting golf. Okay, so it's sort of like The Last of Us Part 2, only with less disappointment. Actually, that's not true. We didn't get that rumored Wind Waker remaster, did we? Okay, so it's exactly like The Last of Us Part 2, only with more farming. If you missed the episode yesterday and you're not yet caught up, this week of gaming news is so big that it's practically a proxy E3, with pretty much every major publisher and platform holder hosting a webinar of some description. Yesterday in part one, we covered the Disney Marvel Showcase, the Cyberpunk Night City Wire, and Ubisoft Forward 2022. If you missed that one, then I'll leave a link to it below the like button. Today, we're going to be taking a squeeze at both the Nintendo Showcase and the Sony State of Play, which dropped just a few hours apart from each other. I'm going to tell you right now that there was some good shit in there if you're a farmer. But there was also some cool non-farming related stuff in there as well, I think. I'll have to double check. After all that, we're going to get back to our regularly scheduled This Week in Video Game Programming, featuring a look at what's out this week, sort of free stuff, etc. You know the drill. All right, time to get your pitchforks out, people. Here comes the Nintendo Farming Direct 2022. If you're wondering why my intro block was spammed with farming jokes, it's because Nintendo Showcase was absolutely spammed with farming games. Like literally six of them in a 45 minute showing with the promise of even more farming slash slice of life games on the way. There was Story of Seasons, which arrives Northern Summer next year. There was Fay Farm, which arrives Northern Spring. There was Rune Factory 3 Remake arriving sometime next year and the promise of a new Rune Factory game sometime in the future. There was Harvest Stella, which we already knew about. That arrives on November 4th and there's actually a demo out for that right now on the Nintendo Switch. My personal favorite was Various Daylife, an actual title of an actual video game. I shudder to imagine what the drafts of this would have looked like. Monotony Simulator, Laborious Task Completer, Wage Slave Versus. I don't know, man, but this is kind of par for course for Square, who unironically call their game stuff like Project Triangle and whatever the fuck Nomura calls his Kingdom Hearts releases. No one can make heads or tails of those. I probably missed like four farming games in this summary here, probably, I don't know. Point is, if you like growing virtual crops and selling them to virtual NPCs, then both you and those NPCs are eating well thanks to Nintendo and their third party partners. Outside of this, there were some exciting announcements, one of which opened the show, Fire Emblem Engage. This is the next mainline entry in the beloved tactics-based military-themed saga. It's been a long time since Three Houses, and that one did a huge amount to build the brand awareness of Fire Emblem. I mean, take me for example. I never paid much attention to Fire Emblem before Three Houses, but I dropped about 30 hours into it and I really liked it. I had to drop it to move on to other things, unfortunately, but I really enjoyed my time with it. And with Engage dropping as soon as January 20th next year, I'll definitely be putting aside some time for that. Game of the Year winner It Takes Two makes its way to Switch, which is awesome because it feels right at home there. Fatal Frame Mask of the Lunar Eclipse is a remaster of the creepy photograph game. This one having never been released outside of Japan, so that's kind of cool. It'll arrive in 2023. This next one is, yeah, this this just made me laugh. Box with familiar characters from Fist of the North Star. They'll be your instructors in exercise mode, leading you through various boxing drills. This is Fitness Boxing Fist of the North Star. It looks so fucking goofy, but man, I'm really glad that it exists. This one hit sometime in 2023. Tunic was an indie darling that took the PC scene by storm when it released earlier this year, complete with a stylized manual pulled straight from the 8 and 16-bit eras. It makes sense then that this title would arrive on the platform that birthed its inspiration. Tunic hits the Switch September 27th. Front Mission 1 and 2 are getting remade. The first one will hit the Switch sometime in November. The second will be early 2023. and. Front Mission 3 is apparently on the way as well, but no firm date for that one yet. Octopath Traveler was the next tentpole announcement. It follows the story of eight new travelers and looks as gorgeous as ever. It's arriving on the Switch, PlayStation and the PC on the 25th of February next year. Let's hope that Xbox fans get a look in soon after that. Theater Rhythm is back after a very long hiatus and it's making up for lost time it seems. The new title is called Theater Rhythm Final Bar Line and it boasts a default 385 songs, which you can immediately jack to over 500 songs depending on which edition you purchase. And there's plenty of future songs promised. It's a simple enough premise in this day and age, but the music of Final Fantasy and other Square titles is so iconic 
that it makes the package irresistible. It's out February 16th. This next announcement has turned into a shitstorm, interestingly enough. GoldenEye is coming to the Nintendo Switch subscription service very soon, no specific date yet. It's basically an emulation of the original game, except it's going to support online multiplayer. That's gigantic. No one would have expected that because that certainly wasn't a thing back in the day. Back then, it was all split screen, facility, slaps only, no odd job. And believe it or not, that didn't sound like a sex thing back then because we were all too young to know any better. So that's cool. But then straight after that, Microsoft announced that GoldenEye is coming to Game Pass. Only this isn't an emulated version of the game. It's essentially been rebuilt from the ground up, featuring 4K resolution and a consistent refresh rate. Man, it is just funny saying that aloud about a game that ran at like 13p and 7 FPS if you were lucky. It also features dual analog stick controls, which believe me, that is not how the original controlled. Thank you very much, C buttons. The weird thing though, is that it won't support online multiplayer. Split screen couch play is still there, but online multiplayer is exclusive to the Switch version because that is essentially being emulated and that emulator recreates couch co-op in an online context. Since Microsoft's newly built version hasn't been built to include multiplayer, no emulation tricks can be employed. So yeah, the Switch will look terrible and control badly, but it will support online multiplayer, while the Xbox version will look and play way better, but you're stuck playing it with your mates at home. Personally, I'd go with the Xbox version because if someone is spawn camping you in the vents, you want to be able to reach across and give them a good old slap. Factorio arrives on the Switch on October 28th, Sifu arrives on November 8th, and a bunch of Resident Evil games are rolling out over the next few months. They will be cloud versions, but Resident Evil 2 Remake, 3 Remake, 7, and Village will soon all be playable on Nintendo's handheld. We're getting to the business end now. Tales of Symphonia is getting a remaster that'll hit early 2023. Kirby's Return to Dreamland is a re-release of a 2011 Wii U game and it hits the Switch on February 24th. I do wonder what that price tag will be. I really hope they make some improvements to the core gameplay, let Kirby go prone or something. That'd be pretty cool. Now, it's been a while since we've seen this fine gentleman, but like they say, a delayed appearance can be good, but a rushed appearance is forever bad. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Chris Pratt's dad, Shigeru Miyamoto. Konnichiwa. He was there to reveal two big ticket items. The first was Pikmin Bloom. It's yet another one of those Niantic go outside and walk around games. To be honest, I think it looks really nice and I actually downloaded it. It's not often that I'll go outside, but hey, maybe this will give me the encouragement I need. This is on mobile devices only and it's rolling out now across various regions. So keep checking back if it hasn't hit your iOS or Android store yet. The other reveal was for a much requested sequel, Pikmin 4. We only got a logo reveal and a t-shirt design, but it's nice to know this franchise is still kicking since there hasn't been too much like it since, except for Tinykin, which launched last week and apparently is superb. So if you're hankering for some Pikmin, but you don't want to have to wait until, I don't know, 2024 to guess, then Tinykin should be your first stop. All right, at minute 43 of a promised 45 minute showcase, we we're all certain that the next reveal would be for the long rumored, long leaked Wind Waker or Metroid Prime remasters. And Nintendo, once again, let us down. Disappointing fans with a new video game. Don't they understand the reason we bought the Switch was to buy overpriced remasters? So annoying. Anyway, Austin, just roll whatever it is they showed last. That's right, nerds, Breath of the Wild 2 is here. Well, not here, but it's coming. And it's not called Breath of the Wild 2, it's called Tears of the Kingdom. And you can now totally understand why Nintendo chose not to live stream this in the UK this week. Because revealing a game called Tears of the Kingdom in the same week the Queen dies? 
That's some next level guerrilla marketing right there. The new trailer and name weren't all we got though. We also got a release date May 12th next year. A curious date, I must say. There has long been speculation that Nintendo would hold this next Zelda entry in reserve, dropping it at the same time as a new model for the Nintendo Switch. That looks unlikely now since you don't typically release new hardware mid-year. Having said that, it's still possible since supply chain issues have turned the world upside down now, so you gotta imagine that schedules have blown out some. If I were a betting man though, I'd say that we aren't getting a Switch upgrade in May and that Tears of the Kingdom will be absolutely groaning under the weight of Nintendo's aging hardware. Still, I'm sure it's going to be amazing because Breath of the Wild was an honest to goodness masterpiece and if Nintendo can capture even a fraction of that once again, then we're in for a very good time. Only please don't bring back weapon durability, everybody hated that. And with that, Team Red was done, let's head over to Team Blue. Sony made sure to set expectations ahead of this showcase. They said it would be 20 minutes focused largely on titles from their Japanese partners, and they mostly stuck to that. The showcase opened very strongly with very veiny, very jacked dudes beating the ever living shit out of each other. Ladies and gentlemen, Tekken 8. As is well documented, I am not a fighting games dude, but I hold in high regard the fighting games community, and it's always nice to see them get cool new stuff. I live vicariously through their enjoyment and excitement, and they certainly seem very excited about this one. There is no release date for this one yet, not even a window, so as the trailer says, stay tuned. We've got a quick look at two VR titles in development for PSVR 2. The first is Star Wars Tales from the Galaxy's Edge, and the other one is a tabletop RPG game called Damio. This next one really took people by surprise. This is Like a Dragon Ishin, and it's a remaster of a Yakuza spin-off released back in 2014 for the PS3 and PS4. It's never seen a Western release, but it's getting one now, and it looks awesome. I never actually knew this existed before, but the knockabout combat of the Yakuza series clearly translates well into equally knockabout swordplay, and the idea of a mix of silly and serious hijinks in feudal Japan sounds like a very good time. Sure enough, this game is releasing in February of next year, like pretty much every other game. Other than Ragnarok, I think this was the one that piqued my interest the most. Warning, warning, an instability front is approaching. Take immediate shelter in a stabilized area. Locations impacted include sectors Delta and Echo. called Pacific Drive, and I don't even know what it is, but it appears to be some kind of driving horror game. I can't think of anything like that, but it kind of makes sense since driving through scary dark places in real life is scary. So yeah, a game about that makes sense. There's no further date or details on this one, but it's very much on my watch list. Sin Duality is a mech-based JRPG with some very chonky mech designs and a lot of anime drama going on. It's hitting sometime next year. What was once known as Project Eve is now known as Stellar Blades. This is a PS5 console exclusive and it's looking very flashy indeed, both in terms of its visuals and its combat design. Character models look a little odd though, kind of like the characters you see in a tech demo those like GPU benchmarks. Either way, this looks interesting and it too is dropping next year. If Assassin's Creed Japan and Like a Dragon Ishin and Ghost of Tsushima weren't enough open world Japan for you, then can I interest you in Rise of the Ronin? Take a look. After three centuries of the Tokugawa's repressive rule, the black ships appeared without warning and our nation began to tear itself apart. Those who cleave to the past those who embrace the new, and the Ronin, a warrior free of all masters and bonds. This one is from Team Ninja, who right now are working on Wolong Fallen Dynasty. Turns out this team can walk and chew bubblegum at the same time, as this second project has now been revealed, and it appears to be the first truly open world game they're doing, since Neo and Ninja Gaiden have all been level based. I'm a big fan of this studio, I think they do some of the best melee combat in the business, and if they can combine that with an awesome open world setting, then I think we're in for something special here. The Neo games have been fairly niche in their appeal, so hopefully this widens the funnel leading to Team Ninja, allowing more people to see just how talented they are. And finally, to cap things off, it was time for the big fella. And his kid, who's a lot smaller. I know you. 
God killer. What is it you want from me? Is it a god of war you came to find? You don't really want war. Do you, Kratos? So I'm gonna be real with you. To this point, I have been excited for God of War Ragnarok. I was looking forward to the concluding chapter in this new saga, but I always held in the back of my mind this belief that there was just no way that they were gonna be able to top the first one. I had no doubt it would be good, great even, but my mind was pretty much made up. There was no going home. Ragnarok will play second fiddle to the 2018 masterpiece, and I was okay with that. Watching this, I heard this little voice in the back of my head that just whispered, wait a second. Maybe they're gonna do it. Maybe they're gonna find a way to top it. I'm not saying they will, but I'm saying this trailer was so fucking awesome that it made me believe that it was possible. Where before I thought they had no chance. What a trailer, what a showing. My God, there is just so much here from the characters to the music to the spectacle. This shot of the sky being torn asunder. I felt my brain melting as I watched this. Sony Santa Monica ain't messing around. We all thought Elden Ring had a lock on Game of the Year. Maybe they do, but maybe not. We will make our own destiny. Alrighty, so that's all the showcase news. And with the onslaught of webinars behind us, let's get back to our regularly scheduled programming by asking, so what got announced or delayed this week? Besides all the showcase stuff, of course, I think that goes without saying. Well, first up is Warlander, newly announced this week by PlayOn. This seems to be some sort of medieval siege game, except with robots, it's free to play and it's out in December. Little Nightmares is about to get even more little since it's headed to mobile. The broody adventure title has been confirmed for both iOS and Android and will arrive Northern Winter, no specific date yet. Gundam Evolution is basically Overwatch with Gundam. It sounds kind of cool, not exactly my jam since I'm not into either Overwatch or Gundam, but hey, a lot of people are so hopefully this rings someone's bell this is free to play and it arrives on steam on september 21st other platforms to follow later undetected is a really interesting one it's an indie project that's essentially a spiritual successor to metal gear solid one it's very much wearing its inspirations on its sleeve here but it looks like faithful homage to kojima's seminal work rather than some sort of cheap cash in this is exclusive to steam and it's arriving september 30th and finally one last piece of witcher news i couldn't squeeze in yesterday the next gen port of the witcher 3 is still on track to be delivered before the end of the year. This was early being handled externally by Sabre Interactive, but has since been brought in-house by CD Projekt Red to finish off. It is your standard 4K60 thing, along with some gameplay improvements, and it will be free, which is nice. Two delay announcements this week. The first is for Bomb Rush Cyberfunk, a game that is Jet Set Radio in all but name, right down to having the same music director behind it. This was slated for this year, but a Twitter post from the dev team confirms that the title has been pushed into 2023, no specific date yet. The only other delay announcement this week wasn't exactly a delay, more an update on Stalker 2. There was reporting recently that Microsoft was issuing refunds for the game as its release has shifted into an unknown window. That's technically true, but that's been true ever since Ukrainian-based GSC said they were delaying the game earlier this year. The most recent update from the team is that despite the inconceivably difficult conditions they're facing, development progresses and the title is on track. It's not cancelled, it's still coming, it's just that some of the dev team are literally fighting a war right now, so yeah, bear with them. And kind of say, I don't get too sentimental about most things, but it's been unbelievably fucking inspiring to see the gains that Ukraine has made this week in the defense of their people. A military masterstroke that has completely turned the narrative of this war on its head, and a true testament to the indomitable will of the Ukrainian people. It's really incredible, and I hope it's the beginning of the end of this conflict and that Ukraine emerged triumphant and vindicated. All right, back to them video games. What came out last week? Well, first up is Temtem, which burst out of its early access Pokeball on the 6th. Reviews are still coming in for this one, I guess, since only a handful of outlets have coverage up, but all the coverage is positive. The Washington Post really liked it, scoring it an eight and saying, quote, what Temtem has achieved is remarkable. After two years of being dubbed a copycat, its long-awaited launch may yet inspire copycats of its own, end quote. It must be said that the Steam reviews are a lot less charitable, as the title is sitting at a mixed 62%, owing in large part to the last-minute inclusion of a cash shop and premium battle pass. A disappointing addition to an indie title, 
that maybe it funds future content, so I don't know. Either way, most of the rest of the package has been well received, so it seems like a pretty safe bet if you're looking for a Pokemon alternative to play on other platforms. Gloomwood hit early access last week. This is that thief-inspired immersive sim from New Blood Interactive. This one is absolutely tearing it up with Steam users and critics alike. 93% very positive on Steam, and nothing but wall-to-wall -wall positive press, though no review scores are out yet since we're still in that early access phase. If you're hankering for the sweet touch of the thief that will never come, Gloomwood is currently available exclusively on Steam, but you've got to guess it'll hit other platforms when that early access period wraps up. Circus Electric is that very out-of-the-box looking turn-based RPG set in a creepy circus world. Steam reviews for this one have it at a mostly positive 73%, while critics have it at a strong 75 on Open Critic, painting a picture of a solid core that's a little rough around the edges. PC Invasion scored this one a 7, saying, quote, Circus Electric has a plethora of intriguing ideas. Unfortunately, most of these don't mesh well with the core gameplay, leading to a tedious romp, end quote. Disney's Dreamlight Valley has turned into a low-key sleeper hit. Now, I'm not sure you can say that about a product that apes one of the most successful gameplay formats of all time, crossed with some of the most successful IP of all time, and published by the largest media conglomerate on the planet. And yet here we are, Dreamlight Valley is surprisingly excellent, and it's made true believers out of a host of people who had earlier dismissed it as a cynical cash grab. Steam reviews have this at a very positive 93%, just 1% shy of that coveted overwhelmingly positive rating. Critics are also more than impressed, putting it at a strong 81%. IGN scored it an 8, saying, quote, Disney Dreamlight Valley is an incredibly strong early access start to a bewitching Disney-infused life sim, end quote. And God as a Geek were equally effusive, scoring in a 9, saying, quote, Disney Dreamlight Valley is brimming with Disney magic, but it's also a well-constructed game with plenty to keep you playing, end quote. Finally, Steel Rising, the Souls-like action RPG from Spiders, the team behind Greedfall. Absolutely zero marketing pump behind this one for some unknown reason. I had wondered if that was a reflection on the quality of the title, but apparently it's pretty good. Steam reviews have it at a mostly positive 74%, while Open Critic has this at a fair 72. GameSpot scored it a 7, saying, quote, with an engaging and aggressive combat system and a unique alternative history setting, Still Rising is an interesting, albeit familiar Souls-like, end quote. So what's coming out this week? Well, if you haven't had your fill of World War One themed shooters, then Isonzo hits all platforms bar the Switch today. It's like that really pretty Italian map from Battlefield 1, but a whole game, and it looks really nice. It's a discount title, only 40 Australian dollars, so that should be around 30 US dollars, I think. Positive reviews so far, and some nice buzz amongst the shooter community. You suck at parking. How dare you, but you're right. I can't reverse park to save my life. This describes itself as the only racing game where the goal is to stop, and by that they mean navigate lethal obstacle courses so you can park your car in a tiny square as quickly as possible. This is hitting Xbox and PC today, and it is on Game Pass. Baron Breakfast is that charming bed and breakfast management sim that dropped a few weeks back on PC. I didn't play this one, but I heard nothing but positive stuff about it, particularly about the writing. It's meant to be very clever. If you'd like to play this one on the go and you don't have a Steam Deck, then good news, this is arriving on Nintendo Switch on the 15th. Metal Hellsinger, god damn am I pumped for this one. This is the debut game from newly formed Outsider Studio. They dropped a demo a few months back that was absolutely awesome. It's a rhythm-based first-person shooter with a metal soundtrack featuring a range of artists, including the dude from System of a Down. The reviews for this one have actually already dropped and critics are very happy indeed. It's sitting at a strong 81 on Open Critic. Eurogamer recommended this one, saying, quote, a lean and tightly restrained mashup of more than just Rock Band and Doom, Metal Hellsinger captures the earnest spirit of an underloved genre, end quote. And Game Informer really loved it, scored it a 9, saying, quote, I'm so glad Metal Hellsinger ends with the promise of more to come because I already want more from this series, end quote. This is dropping for all platforms bar the Switch on the 15th and hard to believe it, but it's also day one on Game Pass as well. Enjoy yourself, you are gonna love it. Game of the year, three years running, Outer Wilds finally arrives on current gen consoles on the 15th, courtesy of a next gen update. This is actually a really huge deal because this is the greatest video game ever made. Only the last gen console ports were kind of shit, owing to the way that this game is built and how demanding that is on systems. With more processing power, you can now enjoy this unrivaled masterpiece free from technical drawbacks. I know I joke around and exaggerate a lot here, so I want to be super clear about this. This is actually the greatest video game ever made, and if you haven't played it, you should. I won't say any more than that. Godspeed. Favorite Strand looks nice and chill and wholesome in all the right ways. It's set in Australia in a flying cruise ship that's also a hospital, and you have to go around chatting with people and solving their problems. It's hitting all platforms on the 15th. Biggest release of the week, for me at least, is Return to Monkey Island, the first Monkey Island game in a buttload of years, and it's being made by one of the original creators of the franchise, Ron Gilbert. 
This one has met some backlash owing to its more modern art style, but I like it. And more to the point, I'm just glad that this exists at all. I didn't have a new Monkey Island game on my 2022 bingo card, but here we are. Sadly, this is exclusive to Switch and PC at first, where it'll arrive on the 17th. Gotta hope that a PlayStation and Xbox version will follow soon after that. And finally, one game I want to shout out, There Is No Light. It's a top-down RPG action game with Souls-like elements and some really great art design. This is one that I played during the Steam Next Fest a little while ago, and I was really impressed by it. Showed a lot of promise, and I'd be interested to see how the final product lands. It's hitting PC on the 19th. Okay, so there was one release I left off the list at this point, so uh, put this on your radar. This is Wandering Village, and it's a city building simulation with a twist because the city you're building is actually on the back of some big ass rock monster creature thing. The backdrop to events will change as your host moves throughout the world, and the landscape atop his back will change as you evolve it, starting out with just a few huts and lean tos, and eventually arriving at a bustling village. It's not just the management side of things, though. Poisonous plants pose a constant threat and must be burned back lest they claim your settlement whole. More than the interesting premise, it's the art style that really captured my attention with this one with the more detailed and animated characters set against a background comprised of different brushwork. This looks like a nice chill time so long as the poisonous plants don't get you, and if you'd like to check it out then good news, it's out tomorrow in early access on Steam. I'll leave a link to it on my Steam Curator page, which also has links to all of the other Put This On Your Radar stuff I've covered in the past. You'll find links to all of that below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now, and just a reminder that we are now in the second week of the month, which means you can collect all of your PS Plus games, your Games With Gold, and your Twitch Prime offerings, so grab them before they're gone. Only a few things to shout out this week. The first is Epic, who right now is still giving away some in-game items for Realm Royale Reforged, as well as 100 Days, which is a winemaking simulator. Very classy. On the 16th, that lineup will change to include Spirit of the North, which is an exploration-focused adventure game set in Iceland, as well as The Captain, which is a retro-inspired point-and-click puzzle game about a captain who has to find his way home, getting in all sorts of zany adventures as he does so. Game Pass got its monthly refresh, and while it's far from Game Pass's best month, there's still a few things to shout out here. You suck at parking and Metal Hill Singer I mentioned earlier, but I actually forgot to mention that Disney's Dreamlight Valley is also on there. And with how strong those reviews have been, it's definitely worth checking out this one at that Game Pass price point. Only other thing to point out is Opus Magnum, which looks really weird if you see a screenshot of it, but when you watch it in motion, you are immediately hypnotized by it. It's a tinkering puzzle game where you build these little clockwork contraptions and it has that sort of power wash simulator magic where it starts to do weird things to your brain the more you play it. Don't believe me? It's sitting at 97% overwhelmingly positive on Steam with over 4,000 reviews counted. This one isn't going to be for everyone, but I suspect this is going to surprise a lot of people. Last thing to call out is that Ubisoft are doing a free trial month for Ubisoft Plus this month, their subscription service that lets you play pretty much all of their games. I don't think this is the kind of subscription service you'd want to pay for in perpetuity, but if you wanted to play one or two Ubisoft games this month that you'd otherwise have to pay for, then signing up for a free month and then cancelling before you get charged would be a cheeky but effective workaround. Guys, our feel-good story for the week is just this weird Splatoon concert that happened for some reason with weird Splatoon holograms dancing. Look at this, it's weird. Hopefully that makes you feel good. It makes me feel unsettled in a way, but I don't know, it's a thing. And it's the end of the episode, okay? I'm tired. I've written a lot in the last two days. I've watched a lot of stuff. And there's more to come this weekend with the Tokyo Game Show. Thank you very much for coming by. I always appreciate you. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to drop it a like. If you'd like to see future stuff, then be sure to hit the subscribe button and ding that notification bell. I do have a preview video going up this weekend, which I'm quite looking forward to, as well as some cool reviews next week. I can't talk about those yet, but they're good stuff. So stick around. Thank you again for dropping by. And a big thank you to this week's sponsor. Sponsor, Ridge Wallet. All right, you got a cool wallet, a cool keychain. You know what you need to go with it? A cool car. Yeah, that's how accessorizing works, right? If it sounds ridiculous, then you just haven't heard about the Ridge Wallet Ford Bronco giveaway, where you can win an actual automobile. Don't want a car for some reason? How about some cash? $75,000. Could you fit all of that cash into a Ridge Wallet? 
unlikely, but I think it'd be cool to try and you can try for yourself if you're lucky enough to scoop up that prize. Ridge wallets have been my wallet of choice for years now. I've been using Ridge wallet before they sponsored me. I saw it somewhere on YouTube since they're big into the whole influencer marketing thing. I've had one for almost two years, I think, before Ridge sent me a brand new one called North Shore. I really like this design. But if you don't like it, that's okay because there are tons more colors to choose from, from matte black to navy to red to neon tiki? That's new. They also come in a variety of materials from aluminium or aluminum as Americans call it to carbon fiber to straight up titanium. Is this the same stuff they use on rockets? I don't know, but it sounds cool and it certainly won't ever bend when you sit on it. Ridge wallets can hold all of your cards, well, within reason, and they have different options for the back, including both a money clip and an elastic money strap. I prefer the strap personally. It's just an extremely comfortable and durable means of keeping your cards and cash safe. Those bulky leather wallets, I can't imagine ever going back to one of those now. These just sit so much more comfortably on the body, you notice it less, and they just look cooler. Ridge's Bronco giveaway gives you one entry for every dollar you spend at their website before September 30th. Grab yourself a wallet for a chance to win. Grab another wallet for your mate or your dad or your brother, or just another one to treat yourself and every additional purchase increases your chance of winning. Best of all, Ridge Wallet is a friend of the channel and as such, you can get a 10% discount on any purchase when you use offer code SKILLUP at checkout. That's offer code SKILLUP at ridge.com forward slash SKILLUP for a 10% discount site-wide. Link to that pin below. Give it a click. Best of luck. I hope you win and a big thank Thanks to Ridge for sponsoring this video.